Leviathan, were the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 29. Of those things that weaken, were tend to the dissolution of a commonwealth. Dissolution of commonwealths proceedeth from imperfect institution. Though nothing can be immortal, which mortals make, yet, if men had the use of reason they pretend to, their commonwealths might be secured, at least, from perishing by in turn all diseases. For by the nature of their institution, they are designed to live, as long as mankind, or as the laws of nature, or as justice itself, which gives them life. Therefore when they come to be dissolved, not by external violence, but intestine disorder, the fault is not in men, as they are the matter, but as they are the makers and orderers of them. For men, as they become at last weary of a regular justling, and hewing one another, and desire with all their hearts, to conform themselves into one firme and lasting edifice. So for want, both of the art of making fit laws, to square their actions by, and also of humility, and patience, to suffer the rude and cumbersome points of their present greatness to be taken off. They cannot without the help of a very able architect, be compiled, into any other than a crazy building, such as hardly lasting out their own time. Must assuredly fall upon the heads of their posterity. Amongst the infirmities therefore of a commonwealth, I will reckon in the first place, those that arise from an imperfect institution, and resemble the diseases of a natural body. Which proceed from a defectuous procreation. One of absolute power. Of which, this is one, that a man to obtain a kingdom, is sometimes content with less power, than to the peace. And defense of the commonwealth is necessarily required. From whence it cometh to passe, that when the exercise of the power laid by, is for the public safety to be resumed. It hath the resemblance of his unjust act, which disposeth great numbers of men, when occasion is presented, to rebel. In the same manner as the bodies of children, gotten by diseased parents, are subject either to untimely death, or to purge the ill quality, derived from their vicious conception, by breaking out into biles and scabs. And when kings deny themselves some such necessary power, it is not always, though sometimes, out of ignorance of what is necessary to the office they undertake. But many times out of a hope to recover the same again at their pleasure, wherein they reason not well. Because such as will hold them to their promises shall be maintained against them by foreign commonwealths. Who in order to the good of their own subjects let slip few occasions to weaken the estate of their neighbors. So was Thomas Becket Archbishop of Canterbury, supported against Henry II, by the Pope. The subjection of ecclesiastics to the commonwealth, having been dispensed with by William the Conqueror at his reception, when he took an oath, not to infringe the liberty of the church. And so were the barons, whose power was by William Rufus, to have their help in transferring the succession from his elder brother, to himself, increased to a degree. Inconsistent with the sovereign power, maintained in their rebellion against King John, by the French. Nor does this happen in monarchy only. For whereas the style of the Antient Roman Commonwealth was the Senate and people of Rome, neither Senate nor people pretended to the whole power. Which first caused the seditions of Tiberius Gracchus, Caius Gracchus, Lucius Saturnius, and others, and afterwards the wars between the Senate and the people, under Marius and Sylla. And again under Pompey and Caesar, to the extinction of their democracy and the setting up of monarchy. The people of Athens bound themselves but from one only action, which was, that no man on pain of death should propound the renewing of the war for the island of Salamis. And yet thereby, if Solon had not cause to be given out he was mad, and afterwards in gesture and habit of a madman, and in verse, propounded it to the people that flocked about him. They had had an enemy perpetually in readiness, even at the gates of their city, such damage, or shifts, are all commonwealths forced to that have their power never so little limited. Private judgment of good and evil. In the second place, I observe the diseases of a commonwealth that proceed from the poison of seditious doctrines. Whereof one is, that every private man is judge of good and evil actions. This is true in the condition of mere nature, where there are no civil laws. And also under civil government, in such cases as are not determined by the law. But otherwise, it is manifest, 
that the measure of good and evil actions is the civil law and the judge the legislator who is always representative of the commonwealth. From this false doctrine, men are disposed to debate with themselves and dispute the commands of the commonwealth and afterwards to obey or disobey them as in their private judgments they shall think fit, whereby the commonwealth is distracted and weakened. Erroneous Conscience Another doctrine repugnant to civil society is that whatsoever a man does against his conscience is sin, and it dependeth on the presumption of making himself judge of good and evil. For a man's conscience and his judgment is the same thing, and as the judgment, so also the conscience may be erroneous. Therefore, though he that is subject to no civil law sinneth in all he does against his conscience, because he has no other rule to follow but his own reason. Yet it is not so with him that lives in a commonwealth, because the law is the public conscience, by which he hath already undertaken to be guided. Otherwise in such diversity, as there is of private consciences, which are but private opinions, the commonwealth must needs be distracted, and no man dare to obey the sovereign power. Farther than it shall seem good in his own eyes. Pretense of inspiration. It hath been also commonly taught, that faith and sanctity are not to be attained by study and reason, but by supernatural inspiration or infusion, which granted. I see not why any man should render a reason of his faith, or why every Christian should not be also a prophet, or why any man should take the law of his country, rather than his own inspiration, for the rule of his action. And thus we fall again into the fault of taking upon us to judge of good and evil, or to make judges of it, such private men as pretend to be supernaturally inspired, to the dissolution of all civil government. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by those accidents, which guide us into the presence of them that speak to us, which accidents are all contrived by God Almighty. And yet are not supernatural, but only, for the great number of them that concur to every effect, unobservable. Faith and sanctity are indeed not very frequent. But yet they are not miracles, but brought to pass say by education, discipline, correction, and other natural ways, by which God worketh them in his elect, as such time as he think fit. And these three opinions, pernicious to peace and government, have in this part of the world, proceeded chiefly from the tongues and pins of unlearned divines, who joining the words of holy scripture together, otherwise than is agreeable to reason, do what they can to make men think that sanctity and natural reason cannot stand together. Subjecting the sovereign power to civil laws. A fourth opinion, repugnant to the nature of a commonwealth, is this, that he that hath the sovereign power is subject to the civil laws. It is true that sovereigns are all subjects to the laws of nature, because such laws be divine and cannot by any man or commonwealth be abrogated. But to those laws which the sovereign himself, that is, which the commonwealth mocketh, he is not subject. For to be subject to laws is to be subject to the commonwealth, that is to the sovereign representative, that is to himself, which is not subjection, but freedom from the laws. Which ere our, because it setteth the laws above the sovereign, setteth also a judge above him, and a power to punish him, which is to make a new sovereign. And again for the same reason a third, to punish the second, and so continually without end, to the confusion and dissolution of the commonwealth. Attributing of absolute propriety to the subjects. A fifth doctrine that tendeth to the dissolution of a commonwealth is that every private man has an absolute propriety in his goods, such as excludeth the right of the sovereign. Every man has indeed a propriety that excludes the right of every other subject, and he has it only from the sovereign power. Without the protection whereof, every other man should have a qual right to the same. But if the right of the sovereign also be excluded, he cannot perform the office they have put him into, which is, to defend them both from foreign enemies and from the injuries of one another. And consequently there is no longer a commonwealth. And if the propriety of subjects exclude not the right of the sovereign representative to their goods, much less to their offices of judicature or execution, in which they represent the sovereign himself. Dividing of the sovereign power. There is a sixth doctrine, plainly and directly against the essence of a commonwealth. And tis this, that the sovereign power may be divided. For what is it to divide the power of a commonwealth, but to dissolve it? For powers divided mutually destroy each other. And for these doctrines, men are chiefly beholding to some of those, that making profession of the laws, endeavor to make them depend upon their own learning, 
and not upon the legislative power. Imitation of neighbor nations. And as false doctrine, so also oftentimes the example of different government in a neighboring nation disposeth men to alteration of the for me already set lead. So the people of the Jews were stirred up to reject God, and to call upon the prophet Samuel, for a king after the manner of the nations. So also the lesser cities of Greece were continually disturbed with seditions of the aristocratic hall and democratic hall factions. One part of almost every commonwealth desiring to imitate the Lacedaemonians, the other, the Athenians. And I doubt not, but many men have been contented to see the late troubles in England out of an imitation of the low countries. Supposing there needed no more to grow rich than to change, as they had done, the for me of their government. For the constitution of man's nature is of itself subject to desire novelty. When therefore they are provoked to the same, by the neighborhood also of those that have been enriched by it, it is almost impossible for them. Not to be content with those that solicite them to change, and love the first beginnings, though they be grieved with the continuance of disorder. Like hot blouds, that having gotten the itch, tear themselves with their own nail us, till they can endure the smart no longer. Imitation of the Greeks and Romans. And as to rebellion in particular against monarchy, one of the most frequent causes of it is the reading of the books of policy and histories of the anti Greeks and Romans. From which, young men, and all others that are unprovided of the antidote of solid reason, receiving a strong and delightful impression of the great exploits of war. Achieved by the conductors of their armies, receive with all a pleasing idea of all they have done besides. And imagine their great prosperity, not to have proceeded from the emulation of particular men, but from the virtue of their popular form of government. Not considering the frequent seditions and civil wars produced by the imperfection of their policy. From the reading, I say, of such books, men have undertaken to kill their kings, because the Greek and Latine writers, in their books, and discourses of policy make it lawful and laudable. For any man so to do, provided before he do it, he call him tyrant. For they say not regicide, that is, killing of a king, but tyrannicide, that is, killing of a tyrant is lawful. From the same books, they that live under a monarch conceive an opinion that the subjects in a popular commonwealth enjoy liberty, but that in a monarchy they are all slaves. I say, they that live under a monarchy conceive such an opinion, not they that live under a popular government, for they find no such matter. In summy, I cannot imagine how anything can be more prejudicial to a monarchy than the allowing of such books to be publicly read, without present applying such correctives of discreet masters, as are fit to take away their venomy, which venomy I will not doubt to compare to the biting of a mad dog, which is a disease the physicians call hydrophobia or fear of water. For as he that is so bitten has a continual torment of thirst, and yet abhorreth water, and is in such an estate, as if the poison endeavored to convert him into a dog. So when a monarchy is once bitten to the quick, by those democratic hall writers, that continually snarl at that estate, it wanteth nothing more than a strong monarch, which nevertheless out of a certain tyrannophobia, or fear of being strongly governed, when they have him, they abhor. As here have been doctors, that hold there be three souls in a man, so there be also that think there may be more souls, that is, more sovereigns, than one, in a commonwealth. And set up a supremacy against the sovereignty, canons against laws, and a ghostly authority against the civil. Working on men's minds, with words and distinctions, that of themselves signify nothing, but beray, by their obscurity, that there walketh, as some think invisibly, another kingdom as it were a kingdom of fairies in the dark. Now seeing it is manifest that the civil power and the power of the commonwealth is the same thing. And that supremacy and the power of making canons and granting faculties implieth the commonwealth, it followeth that where one is sovereign, another supreme. Where one can make laws and another make canons, there must needs be two commonwealths of one and the same subjects, which is a kingdom divided in itself and cannot stand. For notwithstanding the insignificant distinction of temporal and ghostly, they are still two kingdoms, and every subject is subject to two masters. For seeing the ghostly power challengeth the right to declare what is sin, it challengeth by consequence to declare what is law, sin being nothing but the transgression of the law. And again, the civil power challenging to declare what is law, 
every subject must obey two masters, who Bodo will have their commands be observed as law, which is impossible. Or, if it be but one kingdom, either the civil, which is the power of the commonwealth, must be subordinate to the ghostly. Or the ghostly must be subordinate to the temporal, and then there is no supremacy but the temporal. When therefore these two powers oppose one another, the commonwealth cannot but be in great danger of civil war and dissolution. For the civil authority being more visible, and standing in the clearer light of natural reason cannot choose but draw to it in all times a very considerable part of the people. And the spiritual, though it stand in the darkness of skull distinctions and hard words. Yet because the fear of darkness and ghosts is greater than other fears, cannot want a party sufficient to trouble and sometimes to destroy a commonwealth. And this is a disease which not unfitly may be compared to the epilepsy or falling sickness which the Jews took to be one kind of possession by spirits in the body natural. For as in this disease, there is an unnatural spirit, or wind in the head that obstructeth the roots of the nerves, and moving them violently, taketh away the motion which naturally they should have from the power of the soul in the brain, and thereby causeth violent and irregular motions, which men call convulsions in the parts. Insomuch as he that is seized therewith, falleth down sometimes into the water, and sometimes into the fire, as a man deprived of his senses. So also in the body politique, when the spiritual power moveth the members of a commonwealth by the terror of punishments and hope of rewards, which are the nerves of it. Otherwise than by the civil power, which is the soul of the commonwealth, they ought to be moved. And by strange and hard words suffocates the people, and either overwhelm the commonwealth with oppression, or cast it into the fire of a civil war. Mixed government. Sometimes also in the merely civil government, there be more than one soul, as when the power of levying money, which is the nutritive faculty, has depended on a general assembly. The power of conduct and command, which is the motive faculty on one man. And the power of making laws, which is the rational faculty on the accidental consent, not only of those two, but also of a third. This endangereth the commonwealth, sometimes for one of consent to good laws but most often for one of such nourishment as is necessary to life and motion. For although few perceive that such government is not government, but division of the commonwealth into three factions and call it mixed monarchy. Yet the truth is that it is not one independent commonwealth, but three independent factions, nor one representative person, but three. In the kingdom of God, there may be three persons independent, without breach of unity in God that reigneth, but where men reign, that be subject to diversity of opinions, it cannot be so. And therefore if the king bear the person of the people, and the general assembly bear also the person of the people, and another assembly bear the person of a part of the people, they are not one person, nor one sovereign, but three persons and three sovereigns. To what disease in the natural body of man, I may exactly compare this irregularity of a commonwealth, I know not. But I have seen a man, that had another man growing out of his side, with an head, arms, breast, and stomach of his own. If he had had another man growing out of his other side, the comparison might then have been exact. One of Moni. Hitherto I have named such diseases of a commonwealth as are of the greatest and most present danger. There be other, not so great, which nevertheless are not unfit to be observed. As first, the difficulty of raising Moni for the necessary uses of the commonwealth especially in the approach of war. This difficulty are a saith from the opinion that every subject hath of a propriety in his lands and goods, exclusive of the sovereign's right to the use of the same. From whence it cometh to pass a, that the sovereign power, which foreseeth the necessities and dangers of the commonwealth, finding the passage of money to the public treasure obstructed, by the tenacity of the people, whereas it ought to extend itself, to encounter, and prevent such dangers in their beginnings, contracteth itself as long as it can, and when it cannot longer. Struggles with the people by stratagems of law, to obtain little summas, which not sufficing, he is fain at last violently to open the way for present supply, or perish. And being put often to these extremities, at last reduceth the people to their due temper, or else the commonwealth must perish. Insomuch as we may compare this distemper very aptly to an ague, wherein, the fleshy parts being congealed, or by venomous matter obstructed. The veins which by their natural course empty themselves into the heart, are not, 
as they ought to be, supplied from the arteries, whereby there succeedeth at first a cold contraction, and trembling of the limbus, and afterwards a hot and strong endeavor of the heart, to force a passage for the blood. And before it can do that, contenteth itself with the small refreshments of such things as cool of a time, till, if nature be strong enough, it break at last the contumacy of the parts obstructed, and dissipateth the venom into sweat, or, if nature be too weak, the patient dieth. Monopolies and abuses of publicans. Again, there is sometimes in a commonwealth, a disease, which resembleth the pleurisy. And that is, when the treasure of the commonwealth, flowing out of its due course, is gathered together in too much abundance, in one, or a few private men, by monopolies, or by farms of the public revenues. In the same manner as the blood in a pleurisy, getting into the membrane of the breast, breedeth there an inflammation, accompanied with a fever, and painful stitches. Popular men. Also, the popularity of a potent subject, unless the commonwealth have very good caution of his fidelity, is a dangerous disease. Because the people, which should receive their motion from the authority of the sovereign, by the flattery, and by the reputation of an ambitious man, are drawn away from their obedience to the laws, to follow a man, of whose virtues and designs they have no knowledge. And this is commonly of more danger in a popular government, than in a monarchy, as it may easily be made believe, they are the people. By this means it was, that Julius Caesar, who was set up by the people against the senate, having won to himself the affections of his army, made himself master, both of senate and people. And this proceeding of popular and ambitious men is plain rebellion, and may be resembled to the effects of witchcraft. Excessive greatness of a town, multitude of corporations. Another infirmity of a commonwealth is the immoderate greatness of a town, when it is able to furnish out of its own circuit the number and expense of a great army. As also the great number of corporations, which are as it were many lesser commonwealths in the bowels of a greater, like worms in the entrails of a natural man. Liberty of disputing against sovereign power. To which may be added, the liberty of disputing against absolute power, by pretenders to political prudence, which though bred for the most part in the lees of the people, yet animated by false doctrines, are perpetually meddling with the fundamental laws, to the molestation of the commonwealth, like the little worms, which physicians call ascarites. We may further add a, the insatiable appetite, or bulimia, of enlarging dominion, with the incurable wounds thereby many times received from the enemy. And the winds, of ununited conquests, which are many times a burthen, and with less danger lost, than kept, as also the lethargy of ease, and consumption of riot and vain expense. Dissolution of the Commonwealth. Lastly, when in a war, foreign, or intestine, the enemy's got a final victory. So as the forces of the Commonwealth keeping the field no longer, there is no farther protection of subjects and their loyalty. Then is the Commonwealth dissolved, and every man at liberty to protect himself by such courses as his own discretion shall suggest unto him. For the sovereign is the public soul, giving life and motion to the commonwealth. Which expiring, the members are governed by it no more, than the carcass of a man, by his departed, though immortal, soul. For though the right of a sovereign monarch cannot be extinguished by the act of another, yet the obligation of the members may. For he that wants protection, may seek it anywhere and when he hath it, is obliged, without fraudulent pretense of having submitted himself out of fear, to protect his protection as long as he is able. But when the power of an assembly is once suppressed, the right of the same perisheth utterly, because the assembly itself is extinct. And consequently, there is no possibility for the sovereignty to re-enter. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button, and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.